me go ahead and turn to 1 John chapter 4. And uh, I want to just say this. The Lord's been speaking to me this for a while, but uh, really revealing it over and over. And, you know, I come from a background where, where I always try to be careful that uh, I don't speak things that cause people's motives to be uh, running after things like running after God's hand instead of running after his heart, right? So it's really always uh, big, very important to my heart that I am very conscious of what I speak about, that it always uh, goes back to being about the Father's heart. Because no matter what we're chasing after in life, ultimately without God there, it's going to be empty. You could get anything you want. You can get spouse. You can get you can get uh, the greatest business. You could be Fortune 500. It's going to all be empty without God. Because without love, you're going to be empty. Amen. Amen. So uh, so the Lord was giving me this a couple times. And we were, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for, for you guys intro, uh, do, introducing us to Ralph, uh, Bonnie, and Richard. And we, we uh, it was cool. They gave us a book a little while ago. And. And I was like uh, getting ready and I saw this book and I was like, how'd this end up in our condo in Ocean City? And I'm like, man, this is really awesome because I've been wanting to read it and I didn't know where Tracy put it. (laughs) So Richard asked me, hey, did you read that book yet? I I said, Tracy got it, buddy. I have no idea. It's in the land of the lost. (laughs) So, so I tell Richard, I have no idea where this book is. Well, there it was sitting there and I was really excited because I, I felt like the Lord said, it's time to read it now, and uh, it was good. We got to sit on the, the, the balcony. I was going to take a picture and send it to you of us reading the book on the balcony. So we're on the seventh floor balcony looking at the ocean, reading this beautiful book, and I just realized, God, you know what's better? Favor's better than money. <laughs> Favor's better than money. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how much money you have. But when favor's on you, you know where your favor comes from. Favor's better than money. And I was, I was, the first time I remember God speaking to me, we were on our first mission trip to India. And I was sitting on the, uh, this, this plane, and one of the guys in our team's like, hey, can we get front row seats? Uh, you know, do you have any first class upgrades? Uh, kind of like, please. And I was like, and they were like, no, we don't. And I was like, oh, well. You know, I don't know that I would pay for first class on a, on a trip to India where we're going to be seeing people that are so impoverished that I would feel bad for sitting in first class. But as I sat back in our seats, I realized something. I sat there in our seats, and my whole row was empty. And I took a picture in the couch position, laid out on my couch, on my 787 or whatever it was, and I took a picture and I put it on Facebook, favors better than money. <laughs> See what first class couldn't, I couldn't buy first class. It wasn't available to me. Favor was available to me. And so I had this huge bench for a 12-hour snooze, man. I tell you what, God is good. And, uh, you know, when you, when you can stretch out on a plane for 12 hours, you're, you're giving God much thanks. I was incredibly grateful. So... So that's a, that's a really important factor because if you've got the, the king of kings heart, then he has all the other king's hearts. It says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and it doesn't say some kings. It doesn't say good kings. It doesn't say any of that. It says the heart of the king. It says the heart of the president of the United States, the next president, that president before, they're all in the hand of the Lord. So what we need to do is walk like We know who we belong to. My dad's the king of kings. You might be president. You might be czar. You might be whatever you are. The king of kings has your heart in his hands. And so they don't even necessarily need to know why they've given you favor. Uh, One of the sure signs of favor is this statement. I don't usually do this, but, and you say, thank you, Lord. Signs of favor. I don't usually do this. That's a common statement goes to Tracy. I don't usually, I don't usually do this, but I'm just going to give you this incredible discount. <laughs> like, no matter what it is, because, because here's the thing. When favor's on your life, when favor's on your life, here's the, here's the greatest thing about favor. It's the same as 
any other attribute of God, grace, mercy, judgment, favor. How do you get it? You sow into it. If you give favor, you'll receive favor. See, we're trying to get favor by some work up. Like, there's no mysteries in the kingdom. It's right in the word. It's written in plain letters so we can all know so we don't miss out. Favor is available by giving favor. We, we, you know, we've, we've done our fair share, and we're going to continue to. We're going to continue to love on the least. We're going to continue to love on the greatest. There's no partiality in our hearts, and we don't ever want to have partiality. We don't want to care who sits on the front row and who sits on the back row. We don't want to care who's in our house. We don't want to care who's not in our house. We, 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 we're not like, oh, this person's coming. Let's clean up. Like, we, 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 we have it clean for everybody. Everybody deserves the best. Everybody deserves the best in the kingdom. Amen? It's a little different way of thinking, but, you know, if you can hear me, it's really good. Um, so favor's the same as grace. Favor's the same as mercy. Favor's the same as judgment. If you judge, you'll be judged. If you give mercy, you'll reap mercy. If you give grace, you'll reap grace. If you give favor, you'll receive favor. And grace and favor really are almost the same word. Unmerited favor is grace, right? You don't deserve it. Praise the Lord. I got favor I don't even deserve. Most of the favor I have, I don't deserve. I don't need to deserve it. I have grace. And I continue to give people what they don't deserve. People don't understand why, why, you do what, why we do what we do and why some of you do what you do. Here's the key. Because I want what I don't deserve. I want everything God has for me. And I need to be a person of grace to do that. All right, 1 John 4, you should all be there by now. Here's an awesome scripture. It says, you are of God, little children, and we have overcome them. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in this world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, and we and he that knows God hears us. And he that is not of God hears not us. Now listen to this last statement. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Hereby. The previous statements are the hereby or therefore. And those statements are this. We know who we are because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And when people don't understand you, you don't need to try to plead your case. It shouldn't be your case anymore. It shouldn't be our case we're fighting for anymore. It shouldn't be our opinion we're trying to drive home. I'm trying to make you see it my way. I don't have a way. And when I do, I'm usually going to find that the world's going to beat that way out of me because I'm not called to live my way or have my life. My life's been given. Right? I think we all gave our lives to Jesus. And if we gave our lives to Jesus, that means I gave my opinions to Jesus. I gave my opinions up and grabbed the word of God to get his fresh opinions. And if you don't know what they are, you're going to live subpar lives. Every area that the enemy attacks is an area of ignorance. See, the better way to describe darkness, darkness is actually a place of ignorance. A shadow comes when there's something blocking light from getting there, right? A shadow, that obstacle or that object is usually my opinion. My opinion is that God is not shining in this area. Therefore, the enemy has rain in an area where I've let darkness uh, be, be um, where shadows are. And that shadows, darkness is a form or also ignorance. They're synonymous here. So ignorance or people perish for lack of knowledge. So our knowledge needs to be solid in the word of God because our understanding of who we are allows us to step into realms and places and we're not confident in ourselves we're confident and bold and courageous because God is our father yes, yes. can you believe this like we, we hear stuff like Leif Hetland he came here he's talking about his story when he went to see the uh, the king or the prince of Persia no it was, it was um, not Persia it was Afghanistan right? And he goes in to see him, and he goes to the th guy, 
he has a guy with him, and the guy says, you need to buy him a really nice gift because that's how they show honor. Guess what? That's in the Bible. And even though he knew it was in the Bible, he didn't like this idea because he doesn't know this guy. And it was kind of like this guy's telling him, this is what you need to do if you're going to see the king. And he goes, he goes, uh, well, how much should I spend? He goes, you should get the best for the king. And then he says, okay, well, we're going to get it. He says, we're going to get him a pen, an ink pen. So he says, okay, we'll go to the store. He says, I'll take you to the right store where you can get him an ink pen that's good for the king. He takes him to the store. He gets ready to buy the king an ink pen. And he goes like, you know, like, man, there's expensive pens here. It's like, here's a $1,000 pen. Here's a $5,000 pen. He goes, no, no, no. You can't get him anything like that. You need to get him something nice. He goes, hey, you have some really nice pens for the king, don't you? Something that he would really be pleased with. And he goes, yes, I have something in the back just for him. And Leif says, well, how much is it going to cost? He says, you shouldn't be worried about those things. Think about this, this world that he's walking into, and he's kind of like living just like you and me. You might say, I don't have it. Well, it doesn't mean he had it. He was looking at the door that's getting ready to open in his life and believing God was taking him somewhere. And if God's going to take you somewhere, God's going to take care of all the details. Right? So, so he ends up paying about 20000 25000 for this pen. And uh, he goes to the king. He gets favor with the king. The head imam, which is a Muslim leader, like one of the main, the Pakistani main leader, is actually uh, becomes friends with him and introduces him to all the other Pakistani leaders. All those leaders begin to call him the apostle of love. And he gets such favor. Why did it happen? I'm telling you somebody else's story because I want you to hear what it's like to go into a place and know who you are. Yeah. See, the problem is, I feel like the limited understanding of who we are keeps us from going boldly. Like you get up on, on, on a platform or you, you get a mic in your hand, all of a sudden you forget who you are. Do you have a story to tell? And if not, sit down till you have one. Get in the Word and pray till you have one. Because when you got something to say, you're going to be bold about saying it. Because it's not going to be somebody else's story. It's not going to be what happened to somebody else. It's going to be like, God has been good to me. It's going to be God has delivered me. God has set me free. And you're going to be able to get up there and you're going to say it proud. Not proud as in pride. Proud as in I know who my God is. I am proud to be a son of the most high God. I am proud to be one of the living ones. The, can you believe this? God loves us such, it's such that, and here's the thing. It says clearly, the world knows them and the world hears them. But we're of God, and he that knows God hears us. Here's where I want you to be really helped today. There's a lot of favor on your life. If you're a giver, there's a ton of favor on your life. You can't settle for less. You really can't settle for less. Sometimes God will give you less to do an assignment, but that's not less. It's God's best. Okay, don't look at, like money shouldn't be your goal and what best is. Just like success should not be tied to money. If money equals success for you, you're going to end up really shallow the rest of your life. Money is actually something that's just currency that helps things get accomplished in the earth. Money moves earth, but heaven is moved by a totally different priority system. Heaven is my resource. Heaven is backing me. Let's go back to the ambassador role. The ambassador role means I walk into a role in which my country, where I come from, and it's not the United States. The country I come from, because I was born again, I was born of a heavenly country, and that country resources my life. That country resources my living. That country resources everything about me much more than money. He supplies my love. He supplies my joy. He supplies my peace. He supplies my money too. But it shouldn't be about money when we talk about being resourced by heaven. I know we've done that in church, but I don't want to do that. I refuse to sell short of the fullness of God. And you should do the same. 
I want the most from the most high. Can you imagine the most wants it, the most high wants to give you the most? Here's a here's another scripture in Romans 8. In fact, it's 1228. All right. So as I as I land shortly, here it is, Romans 8, 28, 830, sorry, 830. And those who he predestined, he called, and those who he justified, he also glorified. And when they shall say in response to these things, if God is for us, then who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son. Listen, everyone in this room that feels like you might not really, uh, you might really ha not have status in life. Listen to everyone in this room that might feel alone. This is a, the lie of the enemy because God is for you. You wouldn't be in this room if God wasn't for you. Even if you didn't know Jesus and you were in this room, the Spirit of the Lord draws you. And you can't actually take much credit for even knowing Jesus because the Spirit drew us to Jesus. And because the Spirit of the Lord drew us to Christ and we got to know Christ by the Spirit, then we're actually here because the Spirit of the Lord drew us. And because the Spirit of the Lord drew us, now we can understand that I am important and I'm very essential to the plan of God in the earth. So everyone in this room, the inferiority complexes, and all the things that people have said about you need to be broke off of you. And you be adopted by the Spirit of the living God into the fullness and the riches of Christ Jesus. Christ isn't saying that you're less than. Christ isn't having you compare yourself to others. Christ looks at you as the apple of his eye, the best in the room. He doesn't like have favorites. You're all his favorite. The, 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 quest, the question is, am I going to take this favoritism that God gave me and get a little closer, lean in a little bit more, maybe just nail my ear to his heart, and just keep on the vine, feasting from the richness of the throne room. Come on, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we shouldn't be seated down here going, I wish somebody noticed me. Stand up and be noticed. Stand up and know who you are. Stand up and recognize you're a child of the Most High. And then you won't wonder if somebody's going to notice you. You'll notice the most important noticed you. See, when you notice yourself and when you know who you are, you won't walk around wondering if anybody else sees you. You just be delighted that he sees you. It's a beautiful place. Do I live there all the time? Heck no. We'll get real for a second just so y'all are all like, we're there together. We're walking this journey out together. We're trying to learn our reality in Christ together. And so this last statement says this. He who did not spare his son also gave up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, freely give us all things? Hear that again. He that did not spare his own son, but he gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with Jesus, freely give us all things? Think about this. Jesus gave it all. Father gave it all. And then we're wondering, well, I don't know if he really wants to love me. I don't know if he really sees me. I don't know if he really cares. Why would God let this happen to me? First of all, God doesn't let evil befall his people. He wants his people to stand up and know who they are. He wants you to tread on scorpions and serpents, and they shall by no means harm you. By you standing up and stomping down, you're going to be standing in the right position instead of rolling over and playing dead. The church needs to stop rolling over and playing dead, and we need to get up and stomp. Yes, sir. That's good, brother. That's good. I promise the stone, the whole stone, nothing but the stone. <laughs> so, I'm going to start with this. <laughs> he predestined us. He justified us. He glorified us. What's that look like, guys? I want you to know this. If Solomon's, like, servants... We're sitting there, the Queen Sheba's breath is taken from seeing a servant at the front door, front door man. She sees him like her breath leaves her from seeing the glory that Solomon arrayed because he was a king's kid on his own servants. 
How much greater is the glory that the Father is going to put on our lives? The glory that God puts on our life will actually, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that grace opens up doors that no man can shut. But we have to begin to utilize what God has placed on us and in us. Actually, what it is, is you honor the gift in you so the gift can bubble out of you and then the gift will be on you. See, we're not yielding to the gift in us, which means what? I have to yield to the gift in me. The gift in me makes me have to love when I didn't want to love. That's yielding, right? Surrendering. I don't want to love right now. God says, go make it right. I don't want to have joy right now. I want to have a pity party. Have joy anyway. Step out of you and step into me. And what happens is he begins to work in you. And it says in the Bible, I think it's also in Romans 8. It says, according to the gift of God which works in you is the exceeding greatness that works outwardly. See, it's the gift in you that stirs up in you to will and to do his great pleasure. So you become an instrument and then he adds the splendor on the outside. The splendor, on the, the splendor on the outside is according to the working gift on the inside. We want the glory on the outside. God's like, yeah, me too. Can we get some glory on the inside? Can we clean up the inside of the cup so I can really paint this thing up beautiful? Can I give the $20,000 pen to the king? Can I make you what I called you to be, but can you work on the inside first? Can you let me work on the inside first? Can you call, can I, can I work on you a little bit where I say, hey, forgive, and you say, well, they did da, da, da. No, no, no. No, no, no. I'll forgive, Lord. I'm surrendered to you. See, we got to get to a place where it doesn't matter. You know, I have people that really, really hurt me lots of times. In fact, a few of them are repeat offenders. They've hurt me a lot. And the reality is that no matter how they've hurt me, because, you know, when you work with people, especially uh, I've had, I had a daughter that was like an or She was an orphan. Her, she found her mother dead at 13 years old in their motel. Mom said, don't go to, tr- don't go to school this day. She, Here's the 13-year-old. Mom, you know I have to go to school. They're going to take me again if you don't let me go to school. She goes to school, comes home. Mom's dead, overdose, 13 years old. She got saved at the cave at 16, and then she moved in with us. Let me tell you something. That, that's the easy part of the story. Live with orphans. Orphans need to learn how much they're loved. And the church is full of orphans. I, I'm still a recovering orphan. Oh, <laughs> we're, all, we're all recovering to the reality I'm saying that because here, here's the thing, guys. Here's what I don't like us doing when we're, at the, when we're in front of you guys. I don't like you to think that we figured something out. We're learning together. We're learning together. We really are. The more you receive, the more I, I see. The more you receive, the more I see. We learn together. And the quicker we learn and the more we pay attention to one another and we, the more we honor the gift on each other, the more we accelerate in our own lives. So I don't want to have a singular life where I'm trying to work this salvation all by myself, but I can work out my own salvation, seeing how you're working out your salvation, seeing how you're working out your salvation. And so that's why it's really important that everyone that preaches from the pulpit here, I want them to be really transparent because it's a journey. But the best part of the journey is I'm not alone. I have a good father that goes with me. Amen. Amen. Can you put your hands together for the Lord? So as I wrap up, I, I, do, uh, I do know that I didn't have much time, but uh, it, it says in 1 John 3.20, if our heart condemns us, listen, if anybody struggles with condemnation, guilt, shame, any of these things, they're actually, the problem is that your mind doesn't have the ability to contemplate not having recourse for every action that you do. God took all your recourse and threw it in the sea of forgetfulness, and God called what you did forgotten. If what you did's forgotten, where is it? It's like gone like can't be remembered. So the question is, why do we keep remembering? The worst part is we remember which keeps us doing the same thing. 
If I didn't remember, if I had amnesia that I was an, ever an addict, guess what? I wake up and be like, what should I do? I don't know. The word says I should just tell everybody about Jesus. I forgot who I used to be. I forgot I was a whoremonger. I forgot I was an addict. I forgot I was a money ad addict. I forgot that I was an angry man or a, or a depressed man. I forgot all those things. I forgot those things and I pressed toward the mark and the high calling in Christ Jesus. And because I can forget those things because he forgot them. Listen, it's, it's when God destroys something, it is gone. You can't remember anything but an illusion. The enemy has tried to put that back on you. What you can remember in your mind, you need to say, is forgotten. It's forgotten, it's finished, and I'm moving on. I don't even need to think about that guy. He's dead. How can you live a dead man's life? If you end up, if you end up living a dead man's life, then when you get before God, he's going to say, who are you? I don't know you. If you live a dead man's life and you live the life of something that got forgotten, when you get to him, he's going to say, who are you? Because he died for somebody else. He died for a glorified you. And this is why it's important to walk in the reality of the kingdom of God because he knows you completely different than anyone else knows you. And when you start to recognize who he knows, you're going to start shining who he knows. And God's going to start awakening the reality of each one of you to the glorious kingdom. So it says, so it says that God, this is so beautiful, I love this. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. In other words, what you uh, think is condemning you, God already knows all things and he destroyed the things that would keep you separated. And I won't have time to read Psalm 91, but this part of Psalm 91 that I'll focus on is that it says in Psalm 91, this is cool because we, I was kind of like, why did we start with army dressed for battle? Was, if y'all if y'all were here at the very beginning, we were singing this song, Army Dressed for Battle. Well, the funniest thing is in the in the song where it's done on the CD, the very first part is the guy Dutch Sheets who did that tree. And you guys were waving that tree, right? Y'all had your own little tree r running it around. That's George Washington's flag, right? That's George Washington's flag, appealed to heaven. It didn't make it to the, you know, Star Spangled Banner, but it. It was George Washington's flag. He liked, he liked that flag. In fact, the Indians were like, this guy can't be killed. Stop wasting your ammo on him. Just shoot everybody else around him. At least if this, if this God can't be killed on his horse, then we'll just kill his army so at least they won't. He, he can't hurt us too bad by himself. They stopped shooting at George Washington. I mean, he, can you imagine he's riding through battle? He would take off his coat and have bullet uh, arrow holes and bullet holes through his coat. The general. Take off his coat, and this is his thing. I'm appealing to heaven. <laughs> so I think this is appropriate that, that you're carrying a banner that went with this, and Dutch Sheets is the one that wrote that. So at the beginning of the song, Army Dressed for Battle, Dutch Sheets begins with this. He says, though a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, it shall not come near to you. Only with your eyes shall you behold the reward of the wicked. But you have made the Lord, which is my God, your refuge, even the most high God, your habitation. There shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you. He shall keep you in all your ways. And they shall bear you up, lest your that foot dash against a stone. Ye shall tread upon the lion and the adder and the young lion and the dragon. You shall trample under feet because he has set his love on me. Say that real quick. He has set his love on me. Stand up on your feet and say, he has set his love on me. One more time. He has set his love on me. And because he has set his love on me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he know, has known my name. Come on, do you know the name above all names? 
he shall call on me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him. I will honor him and with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Come on. Does anybody hear what I'm saying? With long life, he shall satisfy me. He will honor me. He will uphold me. Come on. This is our God. 